In this video, we start talking about what happens inside of an organization. That is the management of quality and competitiveness. How organizations actually get things done. Kind of the point of view from inside the organization as it moves forward and tries to create value for its shareholders, for its customers, and for its employees. This first uh, section here where we just talk about management in general and then as we go forward to chapter 7, we'll talk about the organization and teamwork and that sort of thing. And chapter 8, we'll talk about service and manufacturing. But here, we're going to focus on the nature of what it is to be the manager of a company. Management, if you will. Basically, what you're trying to do when you're running an organization is you're trying to create value. We talked about the value equation before. You get $10 in for a customer. I'm just using these examples, of course. You get $10 in for a from a customer. It costs you $8 to deliver that to the customer. That means that you have $20 that you can give to your stakeholders, that is, to, you, to the government for taxes, to your finance people, your bankers for interest, and also, of course, to your shareholder, your equity owners. Managers are the people in the organization that manage this, that have this, this trust of creating a situation where those kind of events occur so that you're creating from suppliers and supplies and capital, you're creating things that are sold for more than they cost you to make. You make a profit so you can continue to buy those supplies and in fact invest in and grow the enterprise and at the same time pay returns to capital and pay returns to the investors and the bankers who are supporting you financially. Managers are those people that do that within an organization. They have the responsibility and the accountability to drive that level of value. The idea is to figure out what to do, that is to set and meet objectives. Um, in order to do this, you have to acquire three types of resources. Basically, you have to hire people, get good people that are hard workers and knowledgeable and deliver. You have to get supplies, the kinds of raw materials that you need, the kinds of equipment that you need um, in order to do and build your product. And you need, of course, the financial resources because you have to pay your suppliers, you have to pay your employees, and the timing of when revenue comes in from customers may be different than when you have to pay for things. So having financial resources available makes is helpful or actually is a requirement for, actually, for being able to build an enterprise, having that cushion of financial resources. Managers are responsible for this overarching process of how organizations work and how they function. It's an important thing to keep in mind, an important thing to think about. That is really what we talk about with management. We'll talk a little bit more about management in the next couple of slides. The other thing to keep in mind is here's an example of a good manager. That's Sergio Marchioni. He was the CEO of Fiat. One, Fiat, one of those companies that had some difficulty, just like every now and then we have companies that have run into difficult situations. Right now we hear about Radio Shack, there may be others. Riding through a restructure, eliminating assets that weren't working, get the assets that are working, improve the, the, the efficiency and the, the, the profitability of them, build a profitable enterprise. Um, since then, they bought Chrysler and now have made Chrysler into a profitable enterprise. Management has a real opportunity to have this kind of a huge impact, something that to, to keep in mind. So let's now talk about the management functions. What is it that managers actually do on a given day? We talk about five basic functions. Planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail, but think of it this way. Planning is figuring out what, you're good, what you have to do. Organizing is getting all the pieces together that you need. Staffing is making sure you have the right people. Directing is telling them what to do. And controlling is making sure that what is, being, is supposed to be done is being done. Controlling the, the as aspects of the business, providing feedback and keeping things focused and in the right direction. Typically, management forms a series of layers of plans, if you will. Strategic plans is what are we trying to accomplish to position ourselves in the market, making products and services. Tactical plans is exactly what we need to do to do that. 
Typically, you might have a marketing strategy which says we want to build our brand and move in, in an upscale to a higher uh, socioeconomic bracket. That might be your strategy. Tactical plans might be launching a new series of products that have a more of a luxury uh, element to them and with the kind of marketing messages that target the higher socioeconomic uh, demographic. Operational plans is actually delivering the product, getting things into the stores, making sure that the, um, the inventory has the right quality, there's the right levels of inventory, you're replacing things that are sold relatively quickly and cleanly. And lastly, you have contingent plans. What happens if? What if there's a storm? What if there's uh, if the customers don't show up? What if particular products don't service? What do we do? How do we react? What's our plan B, if you will, in these various situations? This is the planning function when you think about it. Longer term, what you're trying to accomplish, kind of tactically, how you're going to do each of these things, operationally, the the day-to-day -day activities that actually get this done. And then, of course, planning for crisis or some sort of a contingency if a bad situation might occur. Organizing is really sometimes what we think about when we think about what management does. They decide who does what. They decide the sorts of things that need to happen. Look at the plans. Know what resources are necessary. Uh, get all the people that need to be there in a room. Talk to them about what needs to be done. Um, divide up the work into simple tasks, I identify what needs to be done in order to accomplish those tasks, set the deliverables and the timelines, make sure that if something has to happen before something else could happen, a contingency, that that thing is done beforehand and moving forward and step by step and developing project plans and activities. And that's a never ending opportunity to organize the resources, the people, the financials to make sure that all the pieces fit together continuous and always changing. And of course, you have to have good people. So hiring people, finding people, interviewing them, training them, developing them, motivating them, determining how much to pay them when they deserve a raise, um, preparing them, developing them for higher level jobs. It's got human resource development. Tell them, sh show them how to be a supervisor, how to be a manager, how to be a, a district manager, department manager, those sorts of things so they can develop to their fullest extent. Keep them motivated. Um, making sure that you, when you hire somebody, it can cost a lot of money. And so you want to make sure that when you bring them on board, um, you get your, your, your bang for the buck. You keep them for a long time, they stay motivated, and they're very productive and happy. Um, that's something else that management does. Directing is specifically getting people to do, to know what to do, to understand what to do, and then to do it. All right? Motivating them, leading them, getting them to achieve their objectives helping people internalize the, their identity within the organization and move the organization forward according to the agenda and the plans that you have laid out and the organizing, the tasks and the roles that you've assigned, getting them to work in that direction, moving them forward, um, providing the right incentives so that people accomplish things, um, either financial incentives but more sometimes intrinsic incentives, just seeing the accomplishment of getting the job done, effectively working the individual aspect of organizing. Organizing, you figure out what needs to be done and who might need to do what, and then the actual directing part is making sure everyone knows their piece of the pie and is moving their, the project forward and all the parts are fitting together as you go. That's the directing function that we tend to support. Then when all of this is happening, you need to always be making sure that the tasks that are assigned are being done according to the way that we're expected so that they'll fit together in the end. Remember, early on we were organizing. We divided up into pieces and then we gave different tasks to different people to do. Well, those tasks have to fit together in the end, so they have to meet the requirements, making sure that too much money isn't being spent, making sure the budget is being covered, making sure people show up in the morning and get in, that they're doing the job that you expect them to do. It's the follow-up part of the job. A lot of times, many people that are working, you know, in the entry level, maybe summer jobs or whatever you might be doing, you think of managers as the people that are always on your back, making sure you're there, making sure you're doing the job, telling you to stay busy, whatever. Uh, that's this is that's sort of the controlling part. Good managers do that more effectively. Bad managers or less effective managers. 
um, are noticeably telling you what to do and telling you that you're not performing well enough or whatever. A good manager, that becomes a natural part of the follow-up and it's not perceived as nagging, it's perceived as support. And that's what the controlling process is about. But you are responsible to make sure that the assets of the company are treated effectively and are uh, managed appropriately. And that's this idea of controlling. So those are the five areas that we tend to think of when we think about business. Planning, organizing, directing, staffing, and then controlling. When you think about it, figuring out what to do, organizing the activities associated with it, getting all the people on board to do that, tell them what to do, and then making sure that it gets done. That's the, that's the story of uh, business, of, of leadership. Now, leadership occurs at multiple levels. We typically think about leaders as only the top level, which is top management, who the boss is, the top boss, you know, the CEO. Or we think about the people that are running the restaurant or the store we go into or the, the uh, people that are the manager of a particular location, uh, in, um, like if you're renting a car or something like that. Those are really the top manager and the first line manager. But a lot of the business environment is made up of people that are essentially middle managers. But let's talk about each of these separately. First of all, they're, well, first of all, let's talk about how they, they balance each other out. If you notice, when you look at those five roles, top managers tend to be leaning way further towards planning, that is, figuring out what to do. And line managers tend to be more towards controlling, which is why they're always on your back, making sure you're doing your job. And also, they're hiring and staffing and those kinds of things. And middle managers are in the rain in the middle, and it varies a lot depending upon if you're a low-level middle manager, a high-level middle manager, whether you're a staff middle manager or a line middle manager. And we'll talk about those terms a little bit later. But there are differences in focus. So if you think about it, if you want to become, if you want to get promoted and move up in the line, you lean more towards planning, organizing, and staffing, planning, organizing. Really. Um, and show skills in those areas and people will notice and they'll try to move you along into higher levels of responsibility. Top managers. Plan, as we said. Um, these are the presidents, the top executives. They call it the C-suite because you have the CEO, chief, chief executive officer, the CEO, I mean, excuse me, the COO, which is chief operating officer, the CFO, chief financial officer. Sometimes we have the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. Sometimes we have the CTO, Chief Technical Officer. Um, they all start with Chief, C, and so they call it the C-suite. These people tend to work together as a team. Of course, the CEO is the leader of the team. Often, they think of themselves as they, that person thinks of himself or herself as the first among equals. They're all running a major portion of the operation. They're all skilled in those areas. And, um, and they have to work together as a team. But there is a, a hierarchy, typically. Sometimes the CFO reports to the COO. Sometimes the CMO reports to the COO. Anyway, there's all these different roles. And those, uh, those roles, the, top, the, the highest in a public company, the, the people that have the highest level compensation, has to be reported in the proxy statement, which is one of the things that is, re, that is produced um, whenever financial reporting is done. So if you want to know how much people make, it's easy to find out. You just go into the public record and you find out uh, the company and what they've, um, what they've filed in terms of their financial reports. Uh, compensation committees are on the board of directors. Um, that's the boss of the COO, or the CEO. All the other C-suite officers tend to report to the CEO. Uh, but some of them may also be board members, but they still report to the CEO operationally. Um, and the, the board has committees. One is the compensation committee. They decide how much money the, the CEO makes. Um, and that's how, and, and having diversity in the C-suite, diversity in the board of directors is increasingly something that has a great deal of visibility and has a lot to do with whether an organization is perceived um, well in terms of its social responsibility and the like. Those are the top managers. Not surprising they worry most about planning and organizing. And by organizing, it means setting the basic organizing structure of the company. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the organizing structures. 
Mark Zuckerberg is an example in terms of compensation. We talk about him all the time as sort of these sort of, this sort of young person that has built this empire of Facebook. Um, but he announced that he was reducing his salary from six hundred thousand dollars down to one dollar. Um, of course, we all sort of know that he also owns a tremendous amount of Facebook, and as long as Facebook shares are making a lot of money and increasing in value, he has plenty to work with, plenty of money to work with. So um, it, it just shows, though, that uh, at the same time, board or executives sometimes make a lot, sometimes make make less, or sometimes make just a nominal amount, like one dollar. But at the same time, they have equity ownership in the company in many cases. So there's all sorts of variability associated with that. Now, the second group, one down from the top managers, are the middle managers. Middle managers, um, someone who is, who is steeped in business and is very successful in business but doesn't make the C-suite, doesn't become a chief executive officer, chief financial officer, tends to be a middle manager for a good portion of their career. And what that means is you have managers working for you, and you work for managers who are senior to you in the organization. That is, you work for C-suite officers, you work for people that were direct reports for them, or direct reports for them, whatever. There may be multiple layers of management. But essentially what your job is, is to take the high-level directives of senior management, uh, the C-suite management, as it, as it flows down into the organization and making it relevant for the part of the organization of, about which you are responsible and making sure that people understand in your organization how one interprets this sort of broad corporate perspective that is being passed along by the senior people. That's what middle managers tend to do. It's a political job oftentimes. It's also a communication job. You need to understand what people are saying and what it means to you and your people. You need to communicate well with your people what's happening. If they have issues and concerns, you also need to run them up the chain to make sure problems and issues get fixed. So that's, what, um, that's one of the important areas to be thinking about. Because of technology, a lot of the roles of middle managers can be actually replaced by good, effective technology and communication platform. And so there's actually been a reduction in some of these middle manager jobs. They talk about there being fat in the middle and stuff like that. Um, organizations can be more productive, but there's risks there because you lose that additional layer of interpretation and understanding and experience. Um, and so there's a give and take associated with those, that, those kinds of uh, roles. Someone who runs a store, someone who runs a plant, someone who runs a department, someone who purchases a particular type of equipment. Uh, for example, um, one, of my, uh, one of my neighbors um, was a manager in, a, um, in Home Depot, he was a store manager, and then he became responsible for, uh, for managing all the contractors that work with Home Depot, first within a region, first within an area, a district area, and then within a region, and then nationally. So that becomes a role, it's a middle manager role, because you have a lot of responsibility for managing all the contractors and how that works across the, all of Home Depot. But at the same time, you're not the CEO or the COO or the CFO, you're in the middle, right? Middle manager roles. Lots of them, but as this um, chart highlights, the new technologies and platforms, social media, all that, uh, can eliminate some of the need for our middle managers. And then, the, the last set, remember middle managers could be second levels, third level, fourth, they could go all the way up. Like in government, there's 15 levels. Where I was uh, with AT&T for years, there were 11 levels of management. Um, some half levels thrown in the middle there, it's closer to 15 if you count the half levels that were there where people could report to someone else at the same level, basically. Um, but that's going down, and the ones that the, the distinction between those all those middle managers and the first line managers is that first line managers tend, or they have people that are working directly with the customer. That is, they are in the in the store, they manage a, a department in the store, but they manage the people that are interacting with customers or suppliers or whatever. So they're managing people that aren't managers. A first line manager manages people that aren't managers. They implement the plans, they get them going, they move all of that, that sort of thing forward as well. So those, uh, that's a summary of the um, first line manager, middle manager, senior manager, 
and how all of those come together sometimes thousands of managers in a large organization because you need someone to run each project that's a middle manager you need someone to run each territory which is a middle manager you need someone to run each department which we'll talk about a little bit later which again is a manager all those middle managers and then you have the top people in the c-suite so now what do managers actually do or how do they what kind of functions do they perform in addition to just having this distinction of first line middle or senior well you have financial managers not surprising they manage money they keep track of income and expenses they do reporting they produce reports accounting is a useful t useful skills of course is so is financial analysis all sorts of statistical analysis and a lot of the quantitative things that we do um, other than the marketing quantitative things, but the quantitative things we do about managing our costs and expenses and returns and investing and all that sort of thing um, is done by financial managers. There's also production and operations managers. These are the folks that run the warehouse, run the, the factory floor. Um, it could be run a software development organization, although they're typically in technology, which we'll talk about also. But sometimes they call that production. If your product or service is a technical product or service, then you're building those things. You're writing the software or whatever. Operations means you're running the warehouse, you're running the back office, you're running the call center. You're running some operation which is interacting with the ecosystem, with the environment, with the customers or the suppliers. Or you could be running the tax operation where you're interacting with the government, right? But you're running an operating environment where people are doing things and interacting in some way with the environment, getting, do, getting things done that need to be done within the organization, getting production and scheduling things and processes and the like. Human resources, remember this is the part like hiring and staffing, right? People that know how, where to find people, they bring staff in, they determine resource needs, they make sure that the jobs are described appropriately, that the right skills are brought on board for particular jobs, deal with different kinds of government regulations. Marketing managers, there's actually multiple types of marketing. There's analytical marketing, which is market research largely, but there's also psychology in there. But oftentimes there's a lot of number crunching, particularly with social media type of things. Advertising, communication, there's working with, uh, with people that produce commercials like you see on Mad Men. Um, there's selling, personal selling, uh, developing all the things that people need, telling the salespeople where to go who to market to, who to sell to, who the target customer set are that they need to go sell to, uh, setting up retail operations, digital media, digital marketing type of activities. All of those kinds of things are what marketing managers get themselves involved with. Then you have the IT managers, managing the infrastructure of the organization, making sure the computers work, the networks work, the printers work, uh, making sure that the software that keeps track of inventories and keeps track of customer feedback and all of that sort of thing, keeps track of the employees and their salaries and their all, all the activities associated with that, that all of that IT activity is completed and done and effectively uh, managed and supported. IT management. We see that at Adelphi. We have the IT department managing our infrastructure, making sure all these different kinds of products uh, work for us. And then what's sometimes called administrative managers um, because they manage essentially a general function but also they're often called general managers particularly when they're higher up in the organization and they have a what's called a profit and loss responsibility I may for example have a uh, run a product uh, a product operation where I'm responsible for if I'm with Campbell's soup I might be responsible for one particular label of soup one type of soup I'm responsible for designing the product, I'm responsible for manufacturing, and I have the people in the manufacturing or in the product design that have contracts with other parts of the organization to actually make the soup, but all of the activities associated with it and the costs are resp my responsibility, as is the advertising and marketing, as is financial reporting about my particular product, and since I manage all of those functions, I'm called a general manager. And um, those are actually very good roles, and many CEOs have gone through a role somewhere in their career where they were a general manager, a product manager of some particular subset of an organization where they not only had one specialized function like marketing, but had all of them under their, um, their uh, 
purview in the sense of having people that reported to them either directly or via, via a matrix approach, which we'll mention in, in a minute, um, and how that all comes together is a general manager, administrative manager. So those are the different kinds of managers that we find ourselves um, running into um, and where you, you see people that might self-identify or you can identify them in these various roles. One thing managers need is they need to be able to lead. There's different ways to lead. You see this all the time. This is an entirely separate area of, of study. It's one of the areas that I do a lot of research in, what makes for effective leadership. But oftentimes, you've seen these people, autocratic leaders tend to just tell everybody what to do. Democratic leaders tend to let people sort of decide what they want to do. And what are called free reign leaders just sort of let things work it out for themselves and they sort of stay hands off. They also call those um, lazy fair leaders. But there's different styles. Sometimes some work better than others depending on different situations. This is an entire, uh, it's actually a lifetime of learning how to be a good leader. But it's certainly not something we cover in detail in this course. But you should keep in mind it's something that you'll, as you move through your career, you'll definitely want to understand and think about how one develops what you can, how you can become an effective leader. Other skills are interpersonal relationships, being built, able to build relationships, being able to communicate clearly and effectively, being able to get people working together as a team, understanding financial aspects of a business. I don't want to underestimate, underemphasize this. It's very important that you understand how and why you're making money. That's the single easiest way to screw up is to think you're doing the right thing, but you don't get the money part right, and so you end up costing your business or your, your own business or the business you're working for tons of money. Um, creating the kind of environment where people feel good and do the right thing, or do the right thing for, with respect to their fellow employees, but also with respect to the shareholders, assets, and customers, and suppliers, and the like. Being the person that's out front doing the work, leading by example, and helping people to be effective in what they do. One of the most rewarding parts about working with a kind of a large organization or a series of organizations and working with people is watching people that were unsure about what was, how they could succeed, become very self-confident and assured and very effective and successful at running, moving forward in business. Um, where do they come from? Managers come from inside the organization being promoted. Sometimes they're hired from outside the organization as well. Um, somebody that's been in a, around a long time, we need a good technical officer to manage our, uh, our IT, uh, and therefore you hire somebody that knows what they're doing. And also directly out of colleges and universities. Uh, you know, people that are hired in perhaps into a management program um, right out of school so that they could be trained and become effective and important uh, contributors um, going forward into the future. So let's talk a little bit here about how decisions are made in organizations. Um, and, then, um, and then we'll just kind of wrap this up and move in, in our next discussion into um, other parts of management but, and how organizations are structured. But decisions are made not by someone who knows already what to do, but by understanding and getting as much the best information one possibly can get. That is recognizing there's a situation out there that needs to have a decision made. And once you understand that something has to change, there has to be some event, something has to occur that moves you in a certain direction, recognizing the situation, you want to understand what your options are. I could do this, I could do this, I can do this, this might, and then you analyze that, this might cause this kind of situation, but it could also have this negative effect. I could try this, but it might have this negative effect. So you analyze all they are, and then decide which of those options to take. And importantly, oftentimes when you choose one option, you preclude the other options. But sometimes you can take a partial step that keeps your other options open. And so you want to also be thinking about your options in terms of how, is there something that I can do that is along the best path, but at the same time doesn't preclude other options if that becomes important. Because sometimes having additional options 
or not knowing exactly what's going to happen when a decision is made is, it a, is, is, um, is, a, is a factor in the decision process. But once the decision is made, you have to implement it. That means the whole planning process, the strategy, the strategic plans, the tactical plans, the operational plans that we talked about earlier, put in place, and then you want to monitor the consequences as they roll out. And make sure that the option, the decision you took, is realizing its benefit, because it could get off track very easily. Remember, you're not doing this yourself. You're managing a whole organization and how they are thinking about organizations or how they're thinking about the decision. And so you have to make sure everybody's moving in the right direction and it may be going off course and you have to make some adjustments. So the reality of management with all that sort of structure stuff we talked about, the reality of management is that you have to be, you have to have an agenda. That is a plan. You have to know what you're trying to accomplish. You can't walk into a place without thinking about building, not necessarily initially having, but building an agenda of activities that keep the organization moving forward in the right direction. There's timing, there's events, there's who's going to do what, all of that, the planning aspect of it. But in addition to that, you have to make sure that you, have, you build this network of associates and colleagues that you talk to and you both learn from and understand the situation better, but also can rely on to move in the organization in the same direction that you're trying to take the organization as you're moving forward. Those are the kind of the key elements when you think about it. You have to be wanting to go somewhere and have a plan to move it that way and then you also have to have all the people and all the, the contacts that can make sure you know what's going on because they're telling you and they're telling you frankly and honestly and also that you can rely on to take the story forward and move in the right direction. Those are the key ideas when we talk about building management going forward. So that's what, with that, we'll wrap up this, uh, this discussion, this chapter, and then we'll continue with the discussion of management uh, in the next lecture. I'll talk to you soon.